Hi everyone, this is Art from the Bookshelf Odyssey, and today I want to talk about David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Wait, no, it's Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. Yeah, that's the one. Or are, are, are they both the same book? Hmm, I don't know. We'll have to find out. It just recently was announced that that book won the Pulitzer Prize along with another book, uh, which I guess is the first time it's ever happened that two books won. And apparently there's some kind of controversy over that now. Don't ask me why. Um, I couldn't care less. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a tremendous honor whether you share that prize with somebody else or not. Personally, I don't think it takes away of the prestige if it's one book or two. But admittedly, I haven't really thought much about it. I'm not a huge follower of literary prizes. I've tried, but more often than not, I find those books to be a little more boring than I like. There have been some exceptions. Uh, for instance, thanks to science fiction awards, I was able to discover the Lady, o the Lady Astronaut series, which is just brilliant, wonderfully done. So it does have its moments, and I, I think it can help make you aware of books that you never would have read before, which is certainly the case with this book. I've heard it talked about a lot on, on BookTube, and I didn't really watch a lot of the, the videos because um, I, I thought because of its connection to Dickens, it might be a book I would read one day. But then I, I heard that it won the Pulitzer Prize and somebody else was talking about it on, on BookTube. And I just decided, uh, you know what, I'm going to give it, I'm going to read it. Uh, so I got the audiobook version, which I really enjoyed the reader. Uh, he's able to do the Southern accents. Just, it was really lovely uh, listening experience. A, a quick synopsis of the book. Uh, according to its own description, it says, Set in the mountains of southern Appalachia, Demon Copperhead is the story of a boy born to a teenage single mother in a single wide trailer, with no assets beyond his dead father's good looks and copper-colored hair, a caustic wit, and a fierce talent for survival. Relayed in his own unsparing voice, Demon braves the modern perils of foster care, child labor, derelict schools, athletic success, addiction, disastrous loves, and crushing losses. Through all of it, he reckons with his own invisibility in a, pop in a popular culture where even the superheroes have abandoned rural people in favor of cities. And then it goes on to talk about how this book kind of was inspired by or is a retelling of David Copperfield. So that really made me interested in the book because I do like retellings, especially if they have something interesting to say not just about the original work, but about the, the culture that we live in today. I, I don't know. I, I feel like my feelings on this book right now are a little complicated. Well, let's let's just put it this way. I, and I haven't really, like, I have no idea what I'm going to be talking about. So this this video feels a, uh, a little more rambly than my usual rambly videos. You know, I just decided, I just finished the book. A couple days later here, I just decided to turn the camera on and just get all my thoughts out in some kind of verbal vomit, I suppose. Let's consider Dickens first of all. Dickens liked to tell stories, and especially a story that would highlight some kind of problem in society or struggles that people dealt with to make others aware of it. And in that sense, uh, Demon Copperhead follows that exactly right. And this is where, I, this is, I think, where its strength is, that it sets it in a modern day setting um, in a context that you know, I, as an American, would really understand. You know, it takes place in the South. Uh, the story shows a struggle of opioids and addictions and how so many of the people born into those situations are, I guess to quote Dickens from the Chimes, you know, they're born bad. Uh, if not bad themselves, they are born into bad situations over which they have no control and are subjected to these situations and addictions that they can't get out of on their own. And then there's powerful corporations and things like that that are working to keep them addicted to these things. And it's just a giant mess. And I think uh, the author of Demon Copperhead really does well at bringing those out in a very Dickensian way. What I enjoyed in the story too was it was reading through and seeing how she she modernized dickens in a way that was fair to the original story but also presented commentary on the uh society today and what she was writing about today now i, I get 
a little nervous when people say they want to write a, a Dickens story and modernize Dickens because we've had some recent miniseries where they've attempted to do that, and I think it's been a, a spectacular failure uh, on on some levels where. It, you almost wonder if they had even read the original book. I feel like the Great Expectation miniseries, uh, that recent one, had some points uh, like that in it, uh, as well as uh, they did a Christmas. The BBC also did a Christmas Carol one a couple of years ago with Guy Pierce in it, that had some good points, but there was a lot that had changed from the book, and I think there were some things there that they went too far without fully understanding the story itself. So th that's a whole other video i think but I, I so i get a little nervous about these things where they say they, they want to you know update or, or redo dickens but i think barbara king solver does does an excellent job at that so that um though things are modernized things are set in the modern context they they deal with yes being an orphan but also with drugs and alcohol and all kinds of addictions and poverty and, and it really gives you a frank heartbreaking look at what they struggle with the person who wrote this book definitely has an understanding of David Copperfield, the points that Dickens was wanting to make. Uh, she understands that, you know, I guess as, as the kids say today, she understood the assignment <laughs> and uh, she did an excellent job. I'm really happy that she was able to win the Pulitzer Prize for it because uh, to me, I think that not just validates her excellent work in the story, and, and how beautifully written it is. Um, I think it also, to, to me, helps validate the story. Uh, I don't know if validate is the right word, but it brings attention to David Copperfield. And in some sense, Dickens can share in that praise and reward of what she did in her, her story. Now, you know, I don't want it to sound like I'm taking away anything away from Barbara Kingsolver. I don't mean that at all. She she wrote a beautifully written novel that stands on its own for the most part, I think. I mean, this reward belongs to her, I, I, I think. I, I don't have a, any problem with that, with her getting that. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's neat that um, Dickens can share in that. Some other things I enjoyed in the story were the character names and how they were kind of puns on the original names that were then in turn, you know, Dickens liked to make his, his character name puns. So we have like puns within puns, which I, I really, the one that I, I think liked the best was the character who was the, the modern version of Uriah Heep, who Dickens created, it's <laughs> just this horrendous character. And in the book, his name is Ryan Piles. And so I like the, the play on, there's Piles and Heep. And his nickname was U-Haul, which is kind of a, a kind of a connected to Uriah. I can kind of see some connections there, but then also, you know, he was the, the high school football team equipment handler. So he was always hauling these, this stuff back and forth. And this is what she says about him, that the man oozed slime. He was always touching and petting his face and grimy red hair and other things that were just wrong. <laughs> you have the macabres instead of the macabers. Uh, you have Mr. Crickson, who was called Creaky instead of Mr. Creakle. Uh, things like that. It, it just really fun. And, and part of the fun for me to read this was getting to each part of the story I knew about in David Copperfield and, and to see, oh, how is she going to do this now? How is she going to um, change that? And, and this character, oh, that's who this character is in this book, you know, and just making those connections was a lot of fun for me to read uh, as a Dickens fan, especially having the story told by somebody who understood the original material and was able to do the original story justice while still writing a powerful uh, story of her own in her own right and one that has a powerful message just like Dickens would have written and so at the end you know I, I'm thinking this is probably the closest we're going to get to imagine what it would be like for Dickens today to write a novel what would that novel look like I think this gives us a, a good and clear idea about as close as we're, we're going to get, you know, until cl cloning technology makes it possible for us to uh, bring Dickens back from the grave and have him sit down and finish writing The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Okay, I'm sorry, but I I've got, I've got to know, I've got to know how that story ends. Um, people in the future, would you build a time machine maybe? Go back in time, let me know. That would be great. <laughs> anyway, some of the um, 
problems I would have with the story. At times, I think it became a little too distracting. And that could just be me as a reader. You know, let me let me know because for a while I was enjoying it, not because of the message the book was trying to tell, but because of the, like I had mentioned, the connections to David Copperfield. You know, it would excite me to find, oh, you know, here's what she does with Uriah Heep's character. That's really cool. You know, here's how she uh, updates Agnes's character. That's awesome. You know, oh, here's how she modernizes this plot line from the novel. Uh, to the point where I might have been missing the point that she was trying to make by getting caught up in the excitement of of revealing her up, uh, updates of Dickens. Does that make sense? Um, I hope that made sense. Honestly, I'm not sure if there's any way to fix it without changing the uh, uh, the elements of the plot. But then you run the risk of saying, well, this is not really a, a, a real true retelling of David Copperfield because there's a lot of difference here in plot structure and things that have happened. So in that, I think it might be more of me as a reader getting distracted by by Dickens. Um, boy, I need to have that on a t-shirt, you know, distracted by Dickens. That might work. <laughs> One of the other things I didn't care for, and this is definitely my own personal taste as a reader, there, there was some content in it that for me was, uh, I, I, I don't like to read in my in books, like sexual content and descriptions in it that I, I just didn't care for. Uh, and don't necessarily like in my stories. Um, you know, that's just a personal taste as a reader. So there's some of that. I mean, it's a, the coming of age story of a young man. So, I mean, she obviously writes very, very bluntly and accurately about, you know, his his passions, his, uh, his, his hormones, his emotions, all that. Maybe it's a little exaggerated uh, from what real life is like. I don't know. But, you know, those are just a couple of really minor quibbles I have with the story. Anyway, uh, those are some thoughts I had on Demon Copperhead. Is it a book worth reading? I would say, um, yeah, if, if that's, you know, it's not a genre I usually read in. Um, so I was certainly reading outside of my my comfort genre. Uh, but yeah, give it a try. If, especially if you like Dickens, I think you'll appreciate how she adapts it for a modern audience. The case could be made. Well, the original book is just fine for a, for a modern audience. And I, I would agree with that. But she's able to use that story to bring to light the plight of people who are today suffering in poverty and addictions and drugs and all that stuff that has just so crippled so many families that I think it's a worthwhile read. You can at least understand almost the impossible odds they face, which when you get to the end of it, when you summarize it down to, to that theme, I mean, this is a very Dickensian story. Uh, and one that's uh, worth the read. Opinions of it may vary. Um, you know, these these thoughts are my own. I'm I'm glad it has been written. I probably won't reread it, um, which is a big difference between Dickens and a story like this. Uh, I don't really know if I see a need to reread it. I might years later. You know, I might, but it, it's definitely one that I I don't wouldn't immediately put on my reread shelf. But uh, yeah, overall, I I don't want to sound like I'm being too critical of the story. Like I said, the quibbles I have with the, with this book are very minor. Uh, you know, as a Dickens adaptation, as a, you know, an experiment in writing in a Dickensian way in a modern setting, I think it's very, very successful. If David Copperfield hadn't existed and this was an original story, completely original, from idea and conception and all, you know what I'm saying? I get the sense of impact that maybe works like David Copperfield had on the original audience. And, and that was a real joy to read, to almost be like I'm reading a new Dickens. Anyway, okay, now I'm, now I'm starting to ramble. So I'm going to cut things off. Let me know if you've read it, what your thoughts are. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Uh, you know, I'm really interested in discussing this more. Uh, we'll keep the conversation going in the notes below. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe to help keep the channel growing. I, I'm really close to 500 subscribers, so I'm I'm hoping, uh, you know, here in the next couple of weeks, we can get that a uh, little bit of a push and get across the 500 mark. Uh, and so until next time, take care and happy reading.